Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Liz Harrison, and I'm here to present to you today a session that I've called Show and Tell, Creating Access Through Semiotic Artifacts. Although I'm presenting these for an English classroom, these uh, techniques can, of course, be applied to any different subject area. And uh, Kindergarten Had It Right, Show and Tell is really the, the wonderful source of all kinds of creativity. When it comes to semiotics and multimodality, um, we are thinking, of course, about signs, symbols, and signification. So the different modes are really thinking about how we communicate. And when I think about anything with literature, anything with English, there are two sides of this. There is the inhale, where we take in other people's work and we consider and uh, respect their expertise and, and take a look at what is it they've created, what have they um, done to create this, why have they created this? So that is all our inhale. And then there is the exhale, which is us doing those same things. We become the creator and we are the people who are running the show and making those authorial and creative decisions. You can teach without. <laughs> you can teach with just the inhale, but uh, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely always wanted to talk more than I was allowed to talk in every class. So now you're my audience. <laughs> but um, if I had been allowed to talk or encouraged to speak as part of my learning experience, even though I had amazing essay writing instruction, there were a lot of modes that I didn't get to work in very often. And so I think about that now with our students and what feels valuable. And so often other people's work seems to miss the mark um, when we're having these very big experiences of our own lives, especially living this pandemic situation. And so more and more, I'm trying to always balance that inhale and the exhale for my students. So if we can take some of the concepts and practices from the studies of semiotics and multimodality and apply them in our class, classroom, we might find that the logocentrism that has long been part of English, where we prize and prioritize and even deny access on merits of language-based textual skills, um, might reduce. And here we are making things a little bit more accessible for our super diverse Albertan classrooms. Um, we also might step away a little bit from the human centric, anthropocentric views of literature and think about, okay, what else is around us? Uh, what kind of um, interaction and engagement do I have linguistically with my environment? Um, what kind of spatial interactions do I have in community that helps me communicate and get my ideas across? There's a lot of things out there when we decenter the human and think about why else we're engaging with literature and communication and creation. So to capture this idea um, in the literature that I'll share with you, a, a term arose again and again, and I love it, <laughs> um, rhizome, the rhizomatic structures of learning. And basically what this structure is, uh, I've created a little graphic here. You can see it's like a tree. There are roots, there are branches, but... It doesn't have to grow in one direction. It's not a linear form. It's definitely more organic and it can expand and contract and redirect and move around in all different kinds of ways. So uh, what a perfect, um, perfect idea and metaphor and symbol for our English classes and how we might use um, the different modes and the multimodal spaces between them as we transfer ideas between modes of communication. And as we build our um, expertise with what is being signaled or signified in not just the text that we use verbally and written, but also the body language that we use, the visuals we've included, the colors cho chosen, the shoes we wore today, all of those uh, elements come together in different com communication fashions. As Kurt Vonnegut says, there's a lot of uh, navel gazing that can happen in English if we're not studying anything else. And so, you know, even though we have, as English language teachers, um, been logocentric, focused on text for a really long time, um, it may not serve or suit all of our students and their uh, broader needs, especially in our super diverse Albertan classrooms. So we want to be empowered to take on the emerging needs of navigating a digital world and, of course, navigating other areas of 
a lot of writing today ends up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. So it's often part of the process and yet not perhaps part of the product in a written text-based form. Um, I am a student. <laughs> I am a student in a few different directions and um, there is a lot of crossover between these two and yet a lot of people would say, what the heck are you doing these all at the same time for? So I'm currently a Master of Education student uh, in the University of Lethbridge uh, studying Canadian literacies and my focus is on transemiosis and multimodality. At the same time, I am also completing through the Toronto Film School, which by the way, TQS will not accept, just a heads up, um, <laughs> the uh, Graphic Design and Interactive Media Diploma. So uh, although these are two very different courses, they are in a lot of ways the inhale and the exhale for me. So uh, in the master's program, of course, I'm inhaling all kinds of literature about uh, the effects of taking on some of these practices in classrooms, and where the research is coming from and who the forerunners of these kinds of uh, models of thinking and frameworks are. And in my diploma work, I am doing the creative side of things. So what I'm doing here is, even though it seems like a lot, uh, I definitely am seeing the connections and crossover to the point that it's actually helpful, I think, for me to be doing these concurrently. Um, I did start the diploma a little bit before the master's program, although I had decided on the master's program way before, but they only do it every, the, uh, the intake take is every three years. And so to be working on some of these graphic design courses was a great way to get myself in that sort of mindset. And now I have such huge curiosities about how does this function as part of English language instruction, or is this a whole new discipline? So one of the goals that I set for myself this year as my teacher professional growth plan um, is a, an inquiry question, what would happen if, love that, uh, if I held space for student expression to begin with, or or use foundationally a semiotic or visual approach as a literary planning tool or touchstone. So basically, if we make a thing before we write about a thing, is it easier to write about the thing? Or if we are writing, is the goal to make a thing does the writing function in the same way? So uh, sort of manipulating that inhale, exhale balance. Uh, I've been collecting data um, mostly anecdotally for now, although I do have a research uh, term coming up here that I'll be um, looking at uh, specifically this kind of element in the classroom. And uh, I've realized early days, <laughs> but if I'm only looking for students to show me excellence in their written form, I'm gonna miss a lot of what they're able to do. Um, one of the biggest examples that I have of this was a few years ago uh, I had a 10 2 class and a student who was a struggling student and yet a very gifted writer I didn't find this out though until later in the year because on the first assignment they did which was a tattoo design um, they were to design a tattoo tell me about themselves basically um, they designed the tattoo and then they refused to do the writing and I didn't know why so I took the kid over to my desk and I said okay can you tell me about it? And they proceeded to verbally tell me all kinds of wonderful things. And from then I never had a problem with getting them to write because they could see it wasn't a task that was sort of arbitrary. It was actually a human on the other side of receiving their message. The mom phoned me crying. She was so excited that I had given her student another way to show their learning. It completely changed and shifted how I thought about using that kind of supportive structure. Um, maybe that's the goal sometimes, right? Is to have students uh, uh, design and select things that they are experts in or that they can shine with so that they can communicate as effectively as they can using their full linguistic repertoires. So that's where this has come from. Uh, it's been a long journey. That's a, a while ago now, but um, that message, that lesson has never left me since. And so that's where some of this methodology is coming from. Semiosis in high school classrooms. So the questions that we can ask ourselves if we're thinking about integrating this or how we do already integrate this is what can an image communicate that textual language cannot? What other modes of communication should students be equipped to navigate? So I've included some visuals here of a variety of sort of text-based, sort of pictorial-based um, information. And you can see even with the spatial patterning of some of this, the way that they space out, for example, organic chemistry formulations or, um, you know, uh, the way that the musical notes are patterned. There's all kinds of text navigation or mode navigation that students may not naturally come by and that they will need to have some kind of instruction for should they be prepared for the real world. 
Um, semiosis in high school classrooms really helps us consider the building blocks and language of all kinds of discipline. So while we are teachers of English, because um, in Alberta we teach English as a communications course or a literature course, depending on your stream, um, we are the last step in preparing students to navigate multilingual, pluralistic, multicultural spaces. Unless they have a lot of practice coming from home, this might be very outside of their wheelhouse or area of expertise. Um, we can allow students to access their full linguistic repertoires, so using any language that's at their disposal, English or otherwise, as well as, um, you know, visual expressions or uh, voice ex uh, expressions, performances, and things like that. And we can showcase how these different forms are used in industry. So there are definitely career pathways where your best asset will be your vocal performance and not your written textual performance. Um, sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle, and yet we see this in other uh, disciplines that language for, for a science class might be quite different from an English class, and yet there are some crossover foundational skills. So when we're considering the spaces our students dwell in and navigate, it's clear that semiosis in high school classrooms needs to be part of our curriculum. To what extent it belongs in an English language teacher's classroom is still up for debate, I think. Thinking about multiliteracies, uh, that is uh, multiple forms of literacy, how literacy can take on qualities that are not just text-based, um, I'm working from the definition shared by the New London Group in their 1996 article. So multiliteracies for the New London Group is a new approach to literacy pedagogy. We're addressing the multiplicity of communications, channels, and increasing cultural and linguistic diversity in the world today which call for a much broader view of literacy than portrayed by traditional language-based approaches. So it can't just be text. We already know that. <laughs> um, Multiliteracy overcomes the limitations of traditional approaches by de-emphasizing how negotiating the multiple linguistics sorry, linguistic and cultural differences in our society is central to the pragmatics of the working civic and private lives of students. The use of multiliteracies approaches to pedagogy will enable, student, will enable students to have access to the evolving language of work, power, and community, and foster the critical engagement necessary for them to design their social futures and achieve success through fulfilling employment. Those are pretty high stakes promises. <laughs> so uh, if we think about, you know, what are we really preparing our students for? We don't know what the workplace of tomorrow looks like, but we do know probably what an international airport looks like. How does such a place take thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, route them in the right direction, get them on their correct planes in the correct spot at the correct time, and not rely on people's ability to speak a common language. So if we think about that, that is really the world that we're navigating now um, in person and online and digital spaces. There are communicative features that everyone might have access to, to a degree, and yet Without direct instruction, we might not fully understand what it is that we're seeing either. Um, there's always been a, a huge divide with what we teach in school as digital citizenship and then what is actually happening. And it's it's really, you know, we're always going to be kind of playing catch up, but this is an opportunity to be proactive with how we're actually instructing for that navigation through our multiliteracies approaches. Um, I, I'll just draw your attention as well to that last line. This is enabling students to have access to the evolving language of work, power, and community, and creating critical engagement so that they can design their social futures. That is lofty. Like if we think about how we are designing our social futures through language, through communication, you know, if you can't name it, can you become it? I love that sort of quandary. I think that's Madeline Albright quote where she says, you can't be what you can't see. Well, if you can't talk about it, how could you ever create it in reality? Um, so uh, a few questions to sort of frame our discussion as we dive in here. Does digital equal multimodal? 
Not necessarily. <laughs> As we get into some discussion of what the modes are and uh, the ways that digital platforms enable or prevent us from using those kinds of forms, um, you'll see that digital does not automatically equal multimodal, although there is often more opportunity for multimodal work through digital platforms. For example, we can record video, we can record audio, we can record um, a visual element in a way that you can't capture in a text-based um, form the same way. Do English or other language teachers have the expertise to assess in non-textual modes? Maybe and probably not yet. <laughs> so uh, that's part of this conversation and it, it's an ongoing conversation um, academically because you know, a large part of me, a large part of my English teacher background says, hey, what's going to happen with all of the language that I have to teach? How do I fit this all in? And in many ways, I think we are looking at an entirely new discipline, thinking about multi multimodalities and communications in that direction. Um, and yet, we already know that in our Alberta curriculum, we have uh, outcomes that are related to this kind of navigation and this kind of creation. So we have a degree of expertise, and we probably have a lot Lot more than we often think. So hopefully this feels affirming. And yet, of course, as with any new discipline, we probably will have some things to learn and maybe not everything is for us either. So uh, whatever sort of stance you take on this, know that I am struggling with you. <laughs> it's a, a tricky thing. What do we decide here? Modes of communication. You might be already familiar with these. Feel free to skip ahead if you are, no problem at all. I'm just going to give a little brief explanation for each of these. And notice that I have also included uh, icons from the Free Icon Project. Um, these are intended to be pictorial demonstrations of a concept. So uh, I've given the English uh, term as well as a pictorial interpretation, and I'm going to give you a little performance base as well. So textual, I am doing that verbally, and I can do that in writing, as you can see here. Here on my slide. Um, textual is our most common mode in English class, and it's really what people think about when they think of English in a lot of ways. Visual modes are a huge part of what we do as well, very curricularly based if you think about our six strands. Um, visuals can be creating visuals, they can be um, using someone else's visuals, but they are seen. <laughs> so there you go, that's pretty common sense. Um, oral, same thing with the uh, little ear icon there, another one of our core senses. Um, the uh, ability to create audio tracks, to use sound effects, to create um, sound tracks or clips or different different uh, emotions provoked by um, sound can definitely be a huge part of our um, communication tool kit here. And two that we may not think of as commonly in English, although I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, spatial and gestural communication. So gestural, you get your hands in there, you get your body language in there, you can include sign language in this, of course, and yet uh, some very common, um, you know, driving <laughs> um, gestures can be very universal. And there's also gestures that would get you in trouble should you do them in another country because of the way that they are connotably weighted. So, you know, what's attached to that gesture? If I'm in Italy and I do this, it's very disrespectful. I am obviously using that just for an example and not intending to disrespect anyone. But it is sort of like how we would think of the middle finger in Canada. And uh, there can be a lot of confusion, of course, if people are using that inappropriately, depending on which side of this you're on, you can see that this could cause some, some uh, miscommunication issues for sure. And yet also can really um, reveal where people are coming from and what they're saying in interesting ways if text or, or verbal uh, communication is not part of what is possible. Um, spatial communication is... Uh, uh, an interesting one to try and pin down. And the best example I can think of for our English classrooms and curriculum in Alberta is Tableau. So Tableau is, of course, where you're posing from a scene, you're, you're creating a vision, a visual of that picture in the way that you posture and move and space and uh, stand or, or sit or lay or whatever the positioning is there. So spatial communication is an interesting one. And the timing of that needs to be good. So if you think about 
um, you know, driving down a freeway, if you see a sign with information that you need too soon, you might not have caught it and you might have missed something important, or if it's too late, same kind of a problem. So all of these different forms come together in our world in so many different areas. Uh, if you can look out your window and take a look around, there's probably, you know, 17 or a million that you could ma name right outside. So how are these uh, individual modes uh, made multimodal? What a good question. This is uh, about how these interact and are used together. So again, thinking about that inhale and exhale, we can take in these modes of communication and we can also utilize for ourselves in an outward communication, these same tools. Um, a few terms here for uh, newbies to the multiliteracy, multimodality, transsemiotics conversation. Um, we're looking at when we, when we use these tools individually, a single mode, when we're using them uh, together, we're now multimodal. And in between the modes, there are spaces. If you think about um, what is a uh, white space in between them here on my graphic, um, that sort of gives you an idea of the, the space that happens between these modes. So there are things that occur, changes that must be made when you move from a visual mode to a spatial mode or from a spatial mode to a gestural mode. You can't necessarily just do things the exact same way because each mode has features that make it unique and offer you communication outlets that the other ones don't. <laughs> so it gets a little, a little complicated, but uh, if you think about multimodality as the space between and the shifting between, um, sometimes we call that in meshment or meshwork. So where I, I have a written script and I want to create a film, the things that happen in between is uh, are the meshwork elements, uh, those modal shifts. As I move from script to visual, I might leave the text written on the floor, but I take the dialogue into a spoken form, and now I have that oral uh, element to play with as well. So there's uh, a lot of room between them, and yet they each have their own unique benefits and facets. Um, transmodality is moving between these different modes, and then transsemiotics is uh, where signs, symbols, and signification, semiotics, transfer between modes or between symbols. Transsemiotics, you might have a stop sign, you might have a red light, you might have someone honking their horn. All of these things are giving you the same message and yet how they interact together. If the stop sign happens at the same time as the green light happens, you know, sometimes they don't always work perfectly concurrently together. So assemblage happens with uh, whatever uh, collection of things you happen to be using or having in that particular moment, or as part of that particular context, maybe this is the goal by the end and you're working on these different pieces on the way. Um, that is sort of what we're, we're thinking about when we're bringing together more than one mode. We're thinking about the assemblage that we're creating and what it will allow or prevent um, in what we're doing with our class. So I have included uh, the list of references and a much more complete glossary. It's not a complete glossary. <laughs> One of the conversations I've been having in my master's program is the ongoing need for common language, meta language of multiliteracies. And so uh, part of one of the projects that I did this summer was to go through a huge stack of literature and create for myself a glossary and sort of take a look at some of these different heavy hitters in this conversation. And so I have shared that with you as a separate PDF document. You can see the whole glossary and then my list of resources. I have also included a couple of resources at the end of the slideshow just that weren't in that original document that I have also uh, referenced here for your um, using pleasure as you choose. One discovery I made this summer that uh, just equipped me with language that I was so excited to have is that there are three Bloom's taxonomies. What a concept. I have definitely only ever heard of the cognitive domain. And then this summer, my mind was blown open with these new possibilities. So uh, you can see the psychomotor domain in a lot of ways would be related to our physical bodies. And yet at the very top of that pyramid and in the middle, we have this idea of perception and non discursive communication or paralinguistics. So perception is sort of, you know, 
how we might feel those prickles on the back of our neck as things catch our attention. Sometimes it's our um, sensation systems that alert us to danger or to good stuff or, or you know, kind of put us on alert before we know why. And then uh, at the top of that pyramid, the paralinguistics would include things like body language. They might include tone of voice. They might include posturing or a lot of that gestural spatial um, mode stuff. And then in the middle, <laughs> we've got this wonderful affective domain. So uh, I have another session if you're curious about this, about social emotional learning and uh, the journey our school has been on as we develop this um, curriculum for our students and our staff. And uh, the affective domain is one of the resources we've been using and working with, but um, it's significant here when discussing multiliteracies because authors Hollett and Eret have termed felt focal moments. So felt focal moments are perceptible affective entanglements. These moments that register upon our bodies or our participants' bodies or both. Moments of affective intensity entangled as they are across all matter of matter, not always evident to analysts, but especially important to the process of bodies, materials, making new media as part of the flow of collaborative production. Attuning to felt focal moments may open our feeling thinking to the ways in which entangled agencies are productive of ideas, boundaries, and inclusions. Sorry, boundaries and exclusions. So that's Hollett and Eret 2015, and it's been cited in their uh, Eret et al. 2016 on page 365, sorry, 356. <laughs> uh, you can see my proper and correct citation on that PDF. But the idea that part of our communication is what we feel in our bodies, the way that uh, what's happening around us or what we're taking in is actually physically and emotionally available to us or has some kind of impact in that direction. This is an interesting aspect of language that I think is often underestimated, except for in that really wonderful rhyme, um, sticks and stones can break my bones and words will never hurt me, which we all know is a lie. <laughs> it's definitely not the case. Some words can stick with you and slice, oh my gosh, tearing teeth and shredding claws. Uh, I ask this question of my students sometimes. Think about the best thing someone's ever said to you and they struggle. And think about the worst thing someone's ever said to you. And that comes immediately. So we know absolutely that when language hits, it can hit very hard. So these felt focal moments are the ways now, the terms I've, I've discovered uh, that we can qualify some of what happens when we're communicating. Because of course, you know, we can teach it all we want as a dry, dead thing, but communication is alive. <laughs> and so what does that look like as we're communicating in these different forms in life, in these living spaces with um, these pieces that we're now thinking about, if we're following that post-humanist flavor that we're thinking about, humans are not the center of, but just a participant in. And we are we are a participant alongside the materials that we're using and the environment that we're in. And we want to holistically think about the ways that these things interact. So what an interesting idea to center <laughs> this uh, felt focal moment, or even just if you want to call it the affect of language or communication. Um, we definitely walk away with a lot more questions probably than answers when we start to think about this. But I think this is something that we can feel to be true before we maybe can quantify it with uh, research. And, you know, I, I wanted to find, I couldn't find one that I could make work, but the Grinch's heart, <laughs> you know, when he grows his heart three times bigger than it was before. And all of a sudden he has this ability to feel and it changes everything. It changes everything that he's seen and heard and watched and listened to and why he's been so far from these who's now all of a sudden he's got a bit more of an answer as to why could I, how should I engage? <laughs> so uh, if you're thinking about that, that felt focal moment, think of the Grinch's heart and like zooming in and it's growing and that's what's happening. So if we think about this affective domain and uh, the wonderful Brene Brown speaks and writes about this quite often, uh, it can be, it can be the birthplace of creativity. So these things that might feel vulnerable or personal feel that way because they're part of our emotions. And yet we have forms and modes of communication that we can share those things with others. 
tricky, especially if you're, you know, thinking about this and you're thinking about all of those functional communication skills. It's not always the time, but it's not never the time, right? And if we're thinking about what our students might be doing in high school, uh, do we want to make them write only the kind of informational text that they might have in a career or do we want to give them some tools to create art and you know catharsis and space all that kind of stuff when we think of the affective uh, domain how can we capture that and where can we put it <laughs> so artifacts are wonderful for this and this is um you know, sort of what I had mentioned, just to have students in my goal create something for themselves that they can uh, use to sort of guide them and something that holds their idea that isn't text based. Because often, especially now, there are not too many students coming with that kind of skill level where they can capture a complex emotion in a text based way. Can they even name it to have the language piece? Sometimes not. And so uh, to create a touchstone that uses one of the modes of communication and yet allows us to return to that and consider it and work from it um, is going to support students storytelling and their explanations it helps us reveal our personal values you know what it is that we choose to create or what it is that we um, choose to show in whatever mode we choose all of this is revealing of who we are as a person our values our experiences our stories and depending on how we choose to use these artifacts um, we can limit it Maybe we're choosing something for a character from a novel, and so we're not accessing our own personal affect the same way. And sometimes it's a building block for a personal response of some kind, and it will be personal. And we want to make sure that students feel safe and prepared to share those things and that they know that they don't have to if they're not. So um, some of this affect is uh, related to identifying those felt focal points that, that pull us in that direction of creativity and communication. And some is is recognizing how to create safe spaces and safe parameters and set boundaries and protect those boundaries when needed. So it's not always the time to share, you know, your deepest, darkest, whatever with your classmates you just met on the second day. <laughs> we know this, students sometimes not so much. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll share a few examples here going forward, um, and I have uh, shared some of these with you as well in PDF form, um, the assignments that I uh, crafted to make this um, multimodal learning and building an artifact and um, working in these communication modes with students. Um, so you'll see that they require some investment and what i'm showing you here are end products and they're not where we started <laughs> so uh, i've tried to show a little bit of that process but um, when you begin doing this work students often underestimate it because they've maybe had to like color a poster one time and then it got recycled and it didn't matter to them this is something else so this is um, not tokenism and not arbitrary and very intentional and purposeful and so they will require a maker's and a user's investment um, this allows you to have students unpack their own creative intentions and others and it's a really nice i know you're probably thinking okay this is all personal response it actually can be an amazing building block when you're supporting critical analytical work because if you can analyze what you yourself as a creator designed and developed it's an easier jump to look at what another author designed and developed and why they did that because you have your own reasoning and your own internal experience of that process so uh, these um, kinds of artifacts can also provide beautiful foundations for building metaphors. Um, I had a student who created a dragon piece and it became an extended metaphor that the entire class wrote about because we all discovered we were fighting different dragons in different ways. So one of the things I started with this year, and I'm, I'm using this as sort of a comparative example so that you can see the multimodal journey that we were on, um, was script writing. I did this with both my 10-1s and my 20-1s. And they just produce some really beautiful, beautiful work in many different directions. Uh, fun, unexpected things appeared from these plans. And what I began with was the concept of script writing for both. So that was what uh, we were going to start with. And that was sort of the, the purpose that I began this unit plan with. And of course, with that rhizomatic uh, nature of multimodality, new ideas emerged as we went through. So you can see I've sort of listed these off in an order. 
both as uh, classes we began with uh, model text. Um, for 10-1, we used War of the Worlds, the radio play, and we looked at the script writing textual format, as well as the sound effects. So they had um, a few different uh, processes to do to sort of find some of these emotional moments and uh, these felt focal points, which I related to rhetoric and emotion and credibility. So um, they were they were analyzing, they were pulling this apart. It was textually based for sure. And then um, the next part of this was also textual based. So as much as I'm like here, you know, professing the power of multimodality, it's so easy to fall into a text-based pattern where everything is reading and writing. So it's it's something that I continue to struggle with. Don't worry, I have no judgment for anybody else about this either. We're all working on it. Um, so in 20-1, we started with a podcast, so a little bit different um, textual uh, in nature, but oral in presentation. I didn't even give them the transcripts because I wanted their full audio attention. And uh, from there, we went in to an illustration. So uh, if you haven't checked out the podcast, Everything's Alive, super interesting. Basically, they take objects and make them into a character and interview them. So there's um, a bar of soap <laughs> was an interesting one, a mirror at a restaurant, a chainsaw named Josh, who just wants to be Josh, just like Cher, single name, you know. And uh, the one that we listened to was Josh the Chainsaw, the first one. And so students had a sense of this is a weird teacher and a weird assignment, and what the heck are we doing? And it doesn't look like English class. <laughs> and I like to surprise them that way. And then they were illustrating. So it really took a lot of the fear away with 20 1 starting back up. This was not a diagnostic, show me what you got. This is uh, we haven't been in school for a while, so let's figure this out together. Um, so from there, I'll go back to the 10-1 discussion here. We we went into writing our own scripts, and then we took a look at another text model example of Star Trek, and we really started to break down the visual and spatial options that were available to us in that film. Um, there's some beautiful uh, color that shows up with the different Star Trek shirts, very accessible, and just some of the visual storytelling that happens there, they were able to analyze. So then when we took another look at our scripts, we had the form Formatting. We had a beautiful uh, written piece, as we saw with War of the Worlds. And then with Star Trek, we were starting to look at stage directions and sound effects and um, all these kinds of visual storytelling elements that um, can really bring a script together uh, for filmmaking purposes. And at that point, I decided, hey, we should probably film these. <laughs> so that rhizomatic direction, uh, I'd love to take credit for having all these beautiful ideas in advance. Uh, they really grow as we grow and follow the directions that are fascinating to us. Students created these beautiful pieces and I was like, well, we can't stop there. It's not done. <laughs> so uh, from there, we went into a light little bit of storyboarding. A lot of students would have just happily gone right to their cell phone filming. But uh, I said, okay, this is going to be an area of focus. I want you to really think about what are the angles that you're using? How are you telling the story? If it's just you and another person and nothing moves the whole time, is that as interesting as you could make it? Um, we also practiced with Flipgrid. I said, okay, I want you to post a 30 second video just to try it out and see what the features are. And I did show them a very few things. We had been using Flipgrid for my master's courses and uh, I had showed them a little bit about using backgrounds and some of the effects, but of course they're much faster when they just get to play with it and see how it works. At the end, 10-1 had created scripts that hit on every single mode of communication as well as the transmodality between those modes. So this was a really beautiful multimodal project because students had to have um, a sense of how do how do I use the script that I've written to make a speech that isn't boring to listen to? How do I bring this to life? So they really did a lot of thinking and transitioning between these modes in those white spaces. And had we, uh, you know, if we had more time and we could learn something like iMovie, I know we'd have even more capability. And of course, for the limitations that we have in a semester, we stuck with Flipgrid, <laughs> but we did recognize some of those possibilities. And some students, uh, they found ways to play background music. They found ways to pull in extras from the class. They filmed it. At home so they could use their Christmas tree as for their background. There's all kinds of uh, amazing things that students came up with there for sure. I think one of the highlights for me was uh, it was the topic was disclosure. So they had to 
tell something or struggle with telling or not tell something. And one student uh, took on the a terrible secret, finding out Santa is not real. <laughs> and that was just such a highlight. She filmed in front of her Christmas tree. She had Christmas music and the lights were matching. She had a sister who had a Santa hat on and then it was a very sad discovery. But what a beautiful little, uh, beautiful film. And it just, you know, magically came together and she really utilized all those different elements so well. So 20-1, we went quite a different direction. Uh, it's a very different class from the boisterous 31, uh, mostly boys of my tens, to a fairly girl-heavy, very chill, uh, almost comatose 20-1 <laughs> some days. Uh, so we, from our, our podcast, had illustrated characters for ourselves that we were going to interview. And that illustration was um, a simple little exercise, and yet it gave students a lot of things to talk to their character about. Um, one in particular was interviewing her lip gloss and her lip gloss had these beautiful, full, glossy lips. And, you know, if you think about a, like, how does that even work that like sort of meta situation of like, well, of course I have to look good all the time. I, I'm the advertising for this package. <laughs> so just some really interesting abstract thoughts that they were able to connect with the choices that they made in their illustration that then came to serve other purposes in the writing. So they interviewed this object and then we moved into a modern play to sort of have that other uh, inhale side. We've exhaled, we've written our script. Now we're going to inhale another script just to see, you know, how are we doing with this skill? We have some foundations from 10, but not uh, not an expert yet, right? Um, with that modern play, we we're focused on reading and performance. And so that oral mode was uh, a really heavily used one for us. And at the same time, this is a little bit later in the semester than um, for the tens. So I had seen a presentation from these grade 11s already, and it, they were not good. <laughs> they were not good at all. They were, uh, you know, they tried their, their hardest. They did such nice slides. And then they read right from the slides and they read so fast and they didn't talk to the other group members, but what would be on the other slides. And I was like, okay, we're getting uh, slideshows are in our way here. <laughs> so we took away the slideshow element. And what I had them do was choose precious objects to either take pictures of, or if they could, they could bring them in. A lot chose images just because that was an easier access, right, with our COVID times. Um, they chose objects and they had to make a little presentation with no slideshow allowed. They were just going to be speaking informally, casually, but they had to speak about the literal, figurative, and then the message or the, the significance that these objects carried for them. So they were chosen from their real life. That They were the experts already in those objects. The hard part is to share and present. And so um, what happened was after a few days of fear and the, the you know wonderful keeners who get us going had given some good examples of what this could be, then I had uptake and I had a lot of buy-in and um, we ended up before our play reading every day, sharing three or four people's um, objects and they were magical. Oh my gosh, the presentations, because they were so unscripted and natural, they just really said what they felt and what they thought and what their memories were and how this has, you know, become meaningful in their lives. And it was magical. I had <laughs> some, a few highlights here. Um, a student brought in a huge, heavy, welded iron container, and he talked about the way he he wanted to leave it, uh, hopefully far in the future, a long time from now, but he wanted his ashes to be kept in that container so that his surviving family members would be, you know, tasked with carrying this huge piece of metal around. <laughs> So a lot of things to unpack there. I just love that. I thought it was so funny. Um, and then another student had uh, dried flower petals from all these old bouquets, you know, a, a collection in a jar and just all the memories that are attached there. Another student brought in business cards from a woodcutting business they started in the first lockdown and sort of shared that whole journey and their story. And we just, you know, we're so there for them. We're so excited for them about that. And another student shared um, about a necklace that is filled with the ashes of a recently miscarried sibling. So, oh my gosh, we were all over the map. We were laughing. We were almost in tears. Some of us were. It was just magical. And to start our day with that, uh, we're in block four for that class. And at the end of the day, people come and they're tired. We've had a lot of stuff go on in our days and it happening in our brains. <laughs> and they come and yet we just came to life with these felt focal moments attached to these beautiful objects. And even if we couldn't feel the same thing as the person who it belonged to, we felt with them. We
we felt empowered, we felt up, uplifted, we felt excited for them, we mourned with them. Oh, there was just a lot of complex, deep, rich conversation that came from a very simple practice. And their presentations were much, much better than the other ones with the slideshow and the whole rigmarole. Um, so following that play study, following those objects being presented, we um, connected with the play. And if you haven't taken a look at it, I highly recommend One Hour Photo by Setsuro Shigematsu, a beautiful Canadian written play. Um, Setsuro Shigematsu is the writer of a few different plays, and he was also on um, Just for Laughs for a little while. <laughs> so it's an interesting character. Um, he interviews a survivor of Japanese internment camps out of Vancouver and sort of goes through his life story. And as he's interviewing this character, it's recorded as as part of the play. He's using a miniature digital camera to record close-ups of objects and project them on the back of this the stage that he's on with a projection screen. So you get these little miniatures that you're then zoomed into as if it's um, life-size and that's part of telling the story along with these audio recordings. I would love to see it. I haven't been able to see a live version or track down a recording but the play itself is fascinating to read and we added uh, visuals as we journaled about it, we incorporated different pictures as part of our responses. It's in their journals, we're able to create this beautiful personal response, drawing from all of these different sources. And it really, even though our process was so um, visual and gestural and oral, the text performance at the end with their writing was much improved and beautifully supported by all of the work that we had done with those other modes. Rhizomatic unit planning process, which does this look like? <laughs> I'm using the ideas framework that I acquired from the wonderful Dr. Slump at the U of L in my undergrad program. Um, so feel free to borrow from his excellent work here. And then what I've added, I used to have S as stuff, so general stuff that doesn't fit under other areas. And now what I've done is in my unit planning, I use that to think about the skill areas related to the mode or the modes. So if I'm going to have students make a film, I can't just say, go make a film, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> Uh, because they haven't had any instruction, right? What do they do? How do they make that? Uh, what kind of craftsmanship goes into it? What kind of elements? So it gives me a sense of here's the mode that we'll be working in. Here are the things that go along with that mode that would need to be acquired or practiced. And here's what modal mastery for this project looks like. So with my tens, modal mastery for making a movie, Flipgrid, it was great. We know that's not the end of what you can do with filmmaking. It was just what they needed to master to create a successful product for that project. And yet those, those skills do cross over for sure. So uh, asking yourself, okay, here are my six strands. Is my goal an end product in this unique mode? Or is my goal acquiring and mastering a process related to using a mode or multi-modes together? So uh, if you have a sense of here is where we're going, as I did with the script writing, I knew we were going to be writing scripts. Um, I wasn't sure what we were going to do with those scripts. You could see with the 10s, we went to a film direction. With the 12, uh, 11s, we did the um, speaking, presenting skill direction. Yet both of those started with um, the product of making a script that they had written. And yet that product wasn't the end of the process. And then the process continued and then we came to another end product. So you can see how this rhizomatic process <laughs> is beautiful because I can't make one decision for the whole year and just stick with it. I want to sort of grow and expand in the directions that we um, see showing up and materializing in our class. So this is very empowering for students as well. Um, I've, I tell students now, I always, um, and this is true, I, I design a new class for every group in front of me because what, what I did for the year before might not make sense. Um, the texts I choose for them. I like to get to know them a little bit first. And then I sometimes land on a theme for them for the year. And as I've started talking about this, I've had students start to ask, oh, do you have a theme for our class yet? What's the theme for our class? Do you think, what, what do you think it'll be? <laughs> so they're curious about this. They see that, you know, oh, there might be a unique flavor. Oh, that flavor is just for us. Oh, fun. And so it kind of becomes a curiosity and that drives that rhizomatic expansion and growth as well. So where do we want to grow? They start to take ownership and give suggestions and hey, wouldn't it be cool if, right?
If I'm thinking about my product or process, I need to ask myself, is a textual written language process my goal? And if not, what kind of role will it play? So either I'm going towards that goal and I'm going to use different modes on the way to support that, as I'll share in another example here, um, or, or my goal is not to create a textual written piece and yet writing and language in text form will support our development and communication along the way. And then, so to speak, might be left on the cutting room floor. Flash one, world building extended narrative. So in this unit plan, you can see that I have chosen a variety of different texts in the displays. Here are different things that we've taken in. Um, and then in the evaluation, I have a sense of where we're going. I know I wanted them to acquire um, some language and practice with these different narrative elements and character elements, as well as uh, have a real ownership role in building their own world. So the summative mark, the, the goal was a text-based product and yet our text-based product was going to have some visuals could include some oral elements and was considering spatial uh, information as well so the only one we really didn't get to for this was gestural and we worked um, multimodally in the visual textual translation work by the end with our product as well um, the reason that I started with this <laughs> is that in grade nine of course they had interruptions and I really you know, our normal diagnostics don't really fit this year. And I thought, okay, what can I do to help support and build narrative skills as well as evaluate where we're starting from? So this was a great way to review a lot of LA9 content in a very quick, specific way and give students a lot of room for creativity um, and ownership. So what I used was the Dungeon and Dragon Dungeon Master's Guide. It is awesome. I highly recommend it. It's an investment book for sure. It's about 50 bucks, but <clears throat> It gave a ton of information and just ideas about what might we consider when building a world. So questions of resources and assets and location and uh, geography and um, the afterlife, all kinds of fun things that students could decide. Yes, I have this. No, I don't have this. Oh yeah, I've got this. I've got this. Um, and just sort of tick, tick off a little bit of a checklist for themselves. And from this list then develop a map. So the idea was we were taking these different ideas about what could be in our worlds and then we were illustrating them to create a hard copy map. And that map would then be used as we were writing down the road to think about the areas our characters are navigating and the kinds of ter terrain they have to traverse, um, different kinds of plot elements that might play out in these different settings. So it was a, a beautiful hard copy visual for us to keep. And then by the end, we took pictures of them and we loaded them into to our um, slideshows, Char creating character profiles and uh, illustrations or digital drawings of our characters. Um, we had to create a, a write-up of the evil in the world or the villain. <laughs> and then from there, we were ready to start building our actual stories. We went through you know, different uh, elements of narrative structure one by one just to review and also give ourselves some writing time. So in our world building extended narrative, the modal processes and products are reflected here. I took a few different pictures and these are, as I said, the final product with our visual and textual multimodality happening. But you can see the maps that some students have created. I've got one that a student created in a Google Draw and another one that is done by hand. There were fantastic, fantastic maps and they always had those as a hard copy, tangible artifact to look off of as they were crafting their stories. Character profile. And if you haven't used that acronym VARMIT, I have to give amazing credit to my wonderful coworker Heather. She came up with this and it always reminds us of Yosemite Sam. But VARMIT is straight from the top of the um, 10, 20, 30 critical analytical rubric. And these are the attributes that students might talk about in a critical analysis. And here we are in a personal creative response using those same things as our exhale so that we learn to navigate them and use them. So values, attitudes, roles, responsibilities, motivations, and traits. And students had to explain who their characters were. And then we followed them around and watched them interact with the villains and the evils of the stories. So uh, some really beautifully crafted work here. There were 
are too many good examples to even include. And one of the things that I'm going to do with these as we come to the end of the semester is I have a wonderful relationship with our amazing Xerox people. <laughs> and um, we've been going back and forth figuring out how to print these so that they look their best as a, a story hard copy form. And that'll be a gift to the students at the end is to have this hard copy form for themselves because they spend so much time on it. It became about a, a six week project and they worked so hard and just the level of detail. I had some students that wrote like 17 page stories and just took us on twisting adventures that were wonderful. So um, just something really tangible to celebrate. And when you think, you know, what did I do in English class this year? That <laughs> is what I did. I made the films, I made the scripts, I did this amazing story. All of these very visual, hard copy, you know, tangible products have come from our work together. 30-1 journaling. So this is another example of a multimodal approach. And it came from, um, we were, we were online, <laughs> we were doing the lovely bones. And a lot of what we were doing with this novel was listening as I was reading. So it was a nice way to touch base every day. Um, I'd start the block with a weirdo attendance question of some kind. And then um, once every student had um, connected with me, I would say, okay, if you want to read on your own, you can. But most of them were really happy to stick around and listen and probably were comfortable, <laughs> you know, laying wherever they were laying, but uh, just able to sort of tune in and have the experience of being read to was very comforting and very sort of soft and sweet. I found in this uh, lockdown time. So even though they're grade 12s, and I wouldn't normally do that, and that's a normally for us a grade 11 novel, it was the thing that fit. So this is what we did. And from that, we did some really amazing personal creation work. Uh, I had a very creative class in a lot of different directions. And so as they were journaling about the novel, we were taking up this idea of destruction as a force of creation. So great conversations, um, some work in Jamboard, giving some visual examples of that. And, you know, wrapping our minds around that truth of destruction can be a creative force. It's not always the one that we would choose, <laughs> but it can be very creative for sure. And so um, when they were journaling, I wanted to offer them some uh, other modes of um, creation for their journaling because of what we were looking with this with this concept of destruction and creation. So I had such creative, creative students. Um, in the, the picture is closest to the left. A student recorded herself throwing and smashing a glass bottle and then use those shards of glass, this destroyed thing, to make a beautiful new creation of this butterfly sun catcher with all of that broken glass. So what an amazing interpretation for her to take that uh, approach. I just, I loved seeing that um, destruction for destructive force and then how she turned that into a creative, beautiful product. Um, you can see that there's uh, two different um, song or oral based uh, interpretations. So one student made a Spotify playlist and then explained their choices. And then I've included a paragraph of another student who did the same thing and how she's explaining what's happening for her in that song and what it represents. Below that at the very bottom in the middle is an example of a digital illustration that a student created. And then of course their written explanation is uh, part of their journal as well, but they went through and, and really discussed. I suggested a video too. I would have loved to see them kind of explain it, but they were not keen. <laughs> And then some students were keen. And here I have a wonderful student who created and performed a dance. So she's a very gifted ballet dancer and all kinds of other dance. And so she was uh, staying sane as much as she could by just dancing and doing that to bring herself joy. Because um, I know from a, a thank you card that she left me that it was a very lonely and difficult and isolated time. And so, you know, I had her in mind when I was planning this journal entry and I thought, how how can I give this amazing dancer student room to use that as part of her mode of communication? And she she just stepped up and loved that challenge. And it was very meaningful for her and so meaningful for me. I can't believe the amount of work and practice and time she put in. Just some really beautiful results here from all of these students. And you can see our modes that we used. We were working in text and then created some visuals. And for some of us really were working in that spatial modality as well. But all of these different um, projects are also representative of these abstract qualities that take us back to text that students can explain and unpack so that as the assessor, 
I don't want to miss anything about what they're doing here. I need that information about what have you done and why have you done it? So they get that inhale of, okay, we're looking at how authors create their work and this exhale of I'm the author, I'm the creator. Here's how I did this. Here's why I did this. And now it's a personal response, but isn't that some beautiful preparation for their critical analytical work as well? And one more example, this as well, I sh I've shared as a PDF for this assignment. And like I said, just the <laughs> just the basics, but please feel free to run with it and make it your own. Uh, last year, I did this with every English class that I taught, and it was wondrous. And I will use this again in the future for sure. Um, I called these presentations, this I know for sure. And the idea was to take something you were already good at in whatever mode that exists or doesn't exist <laughs> is fine, um, but to take something that you're good at and to share it with the class. Class. And that's the hard part is to get up and talk about yourself with other students in the room and have yourself be vulnerable and possibly seen and hopefully respected and uplifted and rewarded for taking these risks. So it did take a while. This was not a quick presentation to create. Um, I also requested that students um, make sure that they have a plan to engage their audience. And so they were creating an activity for the class to engage with, uh, whether it was bringing in balloons to practice some volleyball serving or different kinds of uh, mind game elements of volleyball. Um, some students had us stand on one foot and balance <laughs> and do different things like that for yoga or skating. Uh, some students baked with masks and gloves and individually wrapped uh, beautiful baked goods. Um, I had a grade 12 student who uh, tackled issues of feminism and domesticity, which was super interesting, found out all kinds of amazing athletes was present, whether or not they could be playing their sports right now. I had a student who was um, an Olympic hopeful that year and was amazing, amazing swimmer and just was talking about that with us. Lots of amazing hockey players, figure skaters, jujitsu masters. I had no idea of the rich talent that existed in my class. And had I never asked the question, I might never have learned all these things, but because I said this is the most important thing, so important that we're doing it first, so important that I want to make sure that you have an easy way in because you already know the subject that you're presenting with, because they were the most important thing and being together and honoring each other was the most important thing. It set the tone for the year in those classes in very unique ways. And that's the magic that I will always try to gain in any kind of modality project. Um, whatever we're working in, I want it to be something that allows us to connect with other people. And that's communication, right? Most recently, I've read uh, these voiced by Theo Van Leeuwen. Um, he's uh, one of the authors who uh, is contributing in a lot of ways to the multiliteracies discourse. The concern that Van Leeuwen raises is this idea of the marketization of discourse. So are we training students in these different areas only to have them fall prey to advertisers who have them create content and then take advantage of that? or misuse or mislead content in, and in ways that students don't recognize. So I think it is important for students to uh, have this sense of what it is to be a maker or a creator. In digital platforms, there's always going to be more to learn, but there's also often limitations. So for example, with Flipgrid, we can't add a musical soundtrack uh, unless we plan that in from another source. So there are limitations to some of these software things, programs. And the other thing is some of this is um, some of the platforms that we use are more perceived choice than actual choice. So Google Slides, I can do a lot of things with them, but I can't do anything. Same with PowerPoint. I can't do anything with PowerPoint. So at some point I need to have a sense of what it is to have the building blocks, whether that's HTML code or SGS code or other things. Um, maybe it's about understanding, you know, how these different visual modes work and can be manipulated. This conversation about about semiosis and how we signal and signify and symbolize. Um, all of this is part of what they will need to be equipped with. And yet we have limitations as high school teachers. So I think framing things with a critical view, we are using this platform, we could use this other platform, both of them have limits, both of them have allowances and capabilities, um, understand how that role of consumership plays in and what it is we need to know as consumers to utilize these things well and protect ourselves. <laughs> um, and then understanding that software 
if you're not paying for it, you're the product. <laughs> so if you're thinking about, am I being manipulated? Am I being sold something? It's less about being sold something than potentially selling your own information or your own access. Um, so concerns on both sides, for sure. Uh, I think there's a lot of schools that are doing some great work with um, trying to figure out firewalling and the struggle is real with cell phones. And how do we, um, you know, make space for these multimodal communication methods at the same time as we're trying to tear their glued on eyes away from their screen. So it's not a perfect system. I have found that I do have more uptake when students have opportunities to use those multiple communication modes than I might if I say we're only ever doing whatever, <laughs> text or writing or reading or no phones ever. So I think um, understanding that the right tool at the right time is really part of this conversation. Is this a new discipline? So all of this conversation about these different modes of communication and how these work what do we think? <laughs> is this the uh, the new English class? Is language going to take a backseat to those other strands? Can it? Should it? Hard to say. I think in our province where we have such super diverse students coming in, these can be wonderful gifts for emergent bilingual or multilingual students. At the same time, I think uh, English is very much a universal language of science and math, and we are equipping students with that for purposes beyond our English language classrooms, of course. So balance? <laughs> is that the answer? I'm not sure. Um, I think for language teachers, we will always have to make those choices. And our, our felt focal moments don't always come from the things that are the most useful flex wise to build those writing muscles or those critical skills or what have you. But sometimes the flow as we're in the flow of using all these different linguistic repertoire skills, visual, gestural, spatial, oral, uh, textual, whatever those skills may be, if we can use the full repertoire, including maybe even other languages we're familiar with, <laughs> as multilinguals do, um, we might find that students are better able to share and show their communication with us because they have access to these other forms that can support the areas that they don't have the same level of strength or ability. Now, a lot of what I do is uh, that rhizomatic, sort of intuitive, let's see where we go with things. I always have a starting point and then I try to leave it quite open-ended for myself about where we're going to land unless I know my goal is a specific curricular outcome related, for example, a critical essay, um, I might find if my end goal is going to be a text-based form, what can I do on the way that will be in other modes or vice versa? You know, how can I use this show and tell frame? You've seen it in three different areas already now. Um, hopefully it's something that kind of comes to mind when you're in a, a moment of need. <laughs> oh, show and tell, just like kindergarten. It's great. <laughs> it really is. It gives our high school students definitely a lot more um, agency because it's something that they're there they have a different level of skill and a different level of intimidation when it comes to non-textual modes so something that they might feel even more equipped for or even more um, capable of producing how might choosing or creating a visual first support my students next steps so just like with those grade 10s and their map or those grade 11s and their object illustration is there something we can do and it it really often doesn't take a huge amount of time to create a tangible visual or other modal touchstone maybe it's having students pose for a tableau and taking a picture and that's the thing that they're then working from how might exploring connotation through physical objects support students critical analysis of text when those grade 11s did all of that discussion about their precious objects they were you know spilling out connotation all over the place about these physical things that now all of a sudden had all kinds of symbolic figurative presence and weight. So doing that with um, different elements in literature can also offer those same critical analytical supports without taking a lot of time away from where you need it with some of those text processes that get a little, a little sticky. <laughs> Um, how can I hold space to help them reveal their skills, talents, and expertise while using their full linguistic repertoire? And finally, what can visuals communicate, accomplish, or hold that text cannot? Going back to that question, what can a picture do 
that a paragraph can't? What can a paragraph do that a gesture can't? What can a gesture do that a sound can't, right? They all have their different areas of support. And the more students understand how to uh, utilize these different modes and the space that happens between them as we transition between those modes, um, the better they're going to be able to use and select the best mode of communication for themselves in our high school classrooms and afterwards as they create their future successful, happy lives. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I'd love to hear where you take these ideas in your own classroom or where these ideas take you. Uh, hopefully, if this is new information, you feel a little more equipped. Uh, you can see my email addresses are included there, and I'd love to hear how this has been useful for you and um, impactful in your teaching practice.